guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I just want to tell our lovely listeners what we go through when recording to not hear <laughs> rain. <laughs> Everything I own is out of this closet I'm recording in today, all on the bed. And you know when your closet's already a mess and you're like, I really need to get in there and do it. And now I'm being forced to. I'm angry at myself. I'm angry at the heat in this room. But guess what? You won't hear rain. So yeah, you sound who great. wins? <laughs> you, <laughs> not me. <laughs> How was your weekend? Uh, the weekend was okay. Yeah, it was pretty um, calm and quiet, actually. My kids were on spring break last week, so they were home all week long. So um, yesterday, Sunday, was like their last day before going back to school. So we really just didn't do a whole lot. You know, we did our thing in the morning, and then by the afternoon, I was like, all right, guys, it's time to start doing chores, laundry, and Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like getting ready for the week. So uh, yeah, it was good. The weekend was great. It was like, nothing really special to report. That's good. I don't want to be a negative Nancy, so I'm not reporting on my weekend. <laughs> um, but Mandy, we did do our live Love is Blind recap we last did. night. We had more people join us. It was a lot of fun. If you want to join that, you can go to patreon.com slash moms and mysteries podcast. We're doing it for a few more weeks and the people are asking us to recap more things. So that may be something we end up doing. Um, TBD. But Mandy, Everyone's been waiting for the second part of this episode, so I, know. I feel like we should just give it to them. We should. In okay. a nice way. Yeah. So we'll kind of start off with a little bit of a recap of part one for those who just need their memory jogged. Uh, so in last week's episode, we started telling the story of Julie Jensen, a 40-year-old mother of two who was found dead in her bed on December 3rd, 1998 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So in part one, we went into a lot of detail about Julie's life and specifically her marriage to her husband, Mark Jensen. So these two were high school sweethearts, but as their story started to unfold, it was far from being an idyllic fairy tale. After Mark and Julie got married and had their first child, Mark became more controlling, and he was even jealous of how much time Julie was spending with their son, who at this point was literally under a year old. He was an infant. So... That's just too much. So <laughs> a little bit of baby. Yeah. yeah. So um, Mark started to have these really ridiculous demands of his wife, Julie. Like he wanted her to keep the house absolutely spotless at all times. And he wanted her to have three meals prepared, you know, at the correct time of day every day. So at some point, Julie did have a brief affair, but the couple ended up staying together and things really only got worse for them after that. Mark never really could get over the affair, and he started to become really bitter and resentful and even hostile towards Julie, which continued on for years and years. Julie started to confide in her neighbor, Brian, and she opened up to him about the many issues in her marriage with Mark. Meanwhile, Mark was behind the scenes plotting the most sinister things you can possibly imagine. He spent hours over the course of several months researching various poisons, their side effects, and how long they would take to work, aka kill somebody. In addition to that, Mark was also torturing Julie by leaving these random pornographic images all over their home and car literally for years, and he wanted Julie to believe that a stranger was actually breaking into their home and leaving these photos around, when in reality it was him all along. In September of 1998, Mark started having an affair with a woman from his job, and things grew even more tense in his marriage with Julie. In the weeks leading up to her death, Julie went around telling multiple people that she genuinely feared for her safety and thought her husband was going to kill her. She specifically told people that she thought Mark was actively poisoning her and even went so far as to write a letter and give it to her neighbor to give to the police just in case anything were to happen to her. When Julie was found dead on December 3rd, Mark claimed she must have had a bad reaction to some of the new medications that she was taking for depression and anxiety, but those who knew Julie, and especially those who really were in on all of her concerns about Mark, had a really hard time believing that Julie's death was merely an accident. When investigators examined Mark's computer, they found 2,100 hits for the word poison and learned that he was online researching ethylene glycol poisoning on the morning that Julie was found dead. Mark's affair with the woman from work, Kelly, was also revealed, providing officers with a potential motive in Julie's death. But still, there wasn't enough to arrest Mark, and he remained a free man for the next few years. 
Mark and Kelly continued their relationship, and in 2002, they announced that they were engaged and planned to be married in May of that year. But unfortunately for Mark, the forensic specialists had been working on Julie's case behind the scenes, and they were about to make an announcement that would finally get the wheels of justice moving in the right direction. Julie's original autopsy was performed by Dr. Michael Shambles, who we mentioned in part one, and he was unable to determine a cause of death. The Kenosha County Medical Examiner still wasn't satisfied with this, so he ordered additional toxicology studies of the kidneys, blood, and gastric contents that had been collected during the initial autopsy. These additional studies showed that there was a, quote, significant formation of oxalic acid crystals, end quote, in Julie's kidneys. So this finding led to further testing in which they ended up finding the presence of ethylene glycol, most commonly used as antifreeze, in Julie's blood, gastric contents, and urine. Breaking these tests down even further, it was revealed that it was likely that Julie was given two doses of ethylene glycol. There were 55 micrograms per milliliter in the blood and 3,094 in the gastric contents. It was determined that Julie was given the poison at least 12 hours before her death and again just before she died. The toxicologist explained that the low concentration of ethylene glycol in Julie's blood and the crystals in her kidney tissue showed that she actually survived the initial phases of ethylene glycol poisoning. The fact that her stomach had such a large concentration tells that she ingested more ethylene glycol at or near the time of her death. The final conclusion was that Julie's death was a homicide for multiple reasons. Number one, the ethylene glycol was not present in the house. Number two, her stomach contents showed that she ingested the poison moments before her death. Number three, Julie would have just been too weak at that point to drink the amount of ethylene glycol found in her stomach without help, and she would have been way too weak to have hid the poison afterwards. Number five, multiple doses were administered. Number six, Julie made reports to the police about fearing for her life from her husband. And number seven, she wrote that letter and gave it to Brian just 10 days before she died. So it was ruled that Julie's death was a direct result of being poisoned with ethylene glycol and that the chemical was administered at least twice, which is inconsistent with suicide. After the results of this testing was in, Kenosha County Medical Examiner Dr. Levine reviewed the whole case with the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office and provided the conclusion that Julie died as a result of homicidal poisoning. This final autopsy was filed on March 19, 2002, more than three years after Julie died. Mark was arrested the very next day. Mark was charged with first-degree intentional homicide and faced life in prison for the murder of his wife, but of course he pleaded not guilty. Mark posted a $500,000 bond about four weeks after his arrest, and he was released. But his bond was later reduced to $300,000. So the $200,000 difference was actually then just deposited into his private defense attorney's bank account, which is very convenient. Yeah. Mark was out on bond on April the 19th, and he did what any normal person would do if they were out on bond awaiting trial for murder. He got right back to his wedding planning. So a couple of weeks later on May 3rd, Mark and Kelly's wedding went off without a hitch, just the way they planned it. Before the year was through, they welcomed a son together. Even though Mark was out on bond living his new life, the state continued their investigation up until his trial. They had more people to interview, more stuff to go through, and all around just plenty of work there was still to be done. They did try to speak with Kelly, but of course she remained really tight-lipped and just wouldn't talk to them. She later said that she knew nothing about Julie's death other than that she had heard that Julie was depressed and sick, and she knew that Mark had to get her medicine prior to her death. Investigators were able to get a warrant to search through Mark's work and personal computers and ended up finding even more evidence. Included in this evidence were organized computer folders full of more penis pictures. So he oh actually gosh. had them labeled in folders labeled small, medium, and large. And so between his personal computer and work computers, Melissa, they found over 5,000 photos of penises. I just can't believe that one doesn't kind of look like the other. I don't really get that. That's a lot. I mean, I feel like that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. He was 
that's a lot. So they also found out that Mark even had notebooks that were filled with drawings of penises. And they learned that he would ask Kelly to even describe to him what kind of penises her former lovers had. Mark's friend and co-worker Stephen told the police that he first met Mark in about 1990 or maybe 91. And they became friends and they started talking on the phone regularly about both work things and personal matters. And they also did family outings together. Stephen said that Mark told him about Julie's brief affair really shortly after they actually met each other, and at that time, Mark was still hurt and very angry. Stephen told the police that he felt Mark actually remained distressed and upset about that affair for as long as Stephen even knew him. Meanwhile, Mark and his defense team were also preparing for trial, and it was their plan to argue that Julie took her own life and tried to frame Mark for her murder. They tried to get multiple pieces of evidence thrown out of the trial, including those voicemails that Julie had left Officer Cosman. If you remember, we talked about him a lot in uh, part one. He was the one that was investigating these penis photos that were showing up everywhere on their property. So Julie had left him those two cryptic voicemails shortly before her death. And in one of them, she stated that she thought Mark was trying to kill her. So the defense does not want that to be in court. I can understand if you were a defense attorney how that would not be a great thing for the jurors to hear. So the defense also tried to keep statements Julie made to her son's teacher and her neighbor Brian from being allowed at trial, as well as the evidence that they obtained during the initial search of the Jensen home and that letter that Julie wrote and left with Brian. The letter and the voicemails ended up becoming a huge issue that actually held up any progress being made in the case. Over the next several years, the circuit court had numerous pretrial hearings where they addressed whether or not the letter and voicemails were admissible. The state said that Julie's statements could be used to show her state of mind, and they could also help counter the defense's argument that Julie took her own life. But the defense said that the letter and voicemails should not be permitted due to the confrontation clause. And if you're like, Melissa, Mandy, what is a confrontation clause? We will tell you. And... Hopefully you'll understand it because it is it's a tough it's a tough thing. It's 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 a little complicated. Yeah, it is. So the confrontation clause provides that a person accused of a crime has the right to confront a witness against him or her in a criminal action. This includes the right to be present at the trial, as well as the right to cross examine the prosecution's witnesses. According to Cornell Law School, the clause was intended to prevent the conviction of a defendant upon written evidence, such as depositions or affidavits, without the defendant having an opportunity to face his or her accusers and to put their honesty and truthfulness to test before the jury. That was a lot. Hopefully it made sense. (laughs) At first, the circuit court said the letter was admissible, but the voicemails were not. However, after that ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court made a decision in the case of Crawford v. Washington, which established that an unavailable witness's hearsay statement is inadmissible under the Confrontation Clause if the statement is quote-unquote testimonial and the defendant had no prior opportunity to cross-examine the witness, which is wild all around (laughs) because she's dead. Right. There's none of this applies. No and void. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's crazy. And we still have so much more to get into after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. And now back to the episode. Okay, so before the break, we were getting into a lot of the pretrial stuff that was going on before Mark Jensen went to trial for the murder of his wife, Julie, who, as we said, was confirmed to have been poisoned with ethylene glycol or more commonly known as antifreeze, which is honestly terrifying Yeah, to even think about um, – somebody doing that to you, somebody that lives in your home. We kind of started talking about a lot of legal terminology towards um, the end before, right before we took the break about this confrontation clause. And they were trying to decide whether this applied in the case or not and whether or not Julie's statements being the letter that she wrote ahead of time to give to the police and the things that she said to other people and specifically to Officer Cosman about feeling like she was going to be killed by her husband. So were these statements that were made by Julie, who of course is now deceased, are they admissible in court? So you guys know we are just really not the brightest when it comes to legal (laughs) stuff. So we'll try to kind of explain what all of it means. It is a little confusing. I was telling Haley that after uh, reading all this stuff in this case, it really just showed me that like, There's no way my brain could ever keep track of all the things that 
a lawyer or a judge has to keep track of because a lot of these things that they deal with, like they go hand in hand, but then they also contradict each other. So having to interpret law, I feel like definitely would not be yeah. my specialty. No. <laughs> and things change, right? Like sure. that new court case changed the original ruling. So I can't remember th things changed. No, absolutely not. I can't do that. Yeah. So a statement is considered to be testimonial. This is what we mentioned right before the break. If the person making the statement foresees that the statement they're making might be used in an investigation or prosecution of a crime. So for example, the statements that Julie made to Officer Cosman and the letters she wrote to the police could be considered testimonial because Julie likely thought that they would be used in an investigation and to prosecute Mark, of course, in the event of her death. But the statements that she made to her son's teacher and the neighbor Brian could be considered non-testimonial because when she was talking to those people, she probably didn't just say the things that she said only because she thought they would be, you know, that they would use them in an investigation. So in light of that Supreme Court decision, Mark asked the court, circuit court to reconsider its previous ruling. And the circuit court ended up deciding that the letter and the voicemails were testimonial hearsay and were not admissible in trial, which is like... I don't understand how. That's crazy to me to think like that the woman who actually was found dead wrote this letter and they're like, no, right. you can't have that. Like that's not evidence in a trial. How could it not be? It's just wild with some of the way that like legal things are worded and you can kind of get these things through. And remember, they even compared her handwriting. They'd had handwriting analysis and stuff. So it was determined that it was definitely her right. handwriting. So it wasn't like somebody else coming up with this secret letter. It's one that had been around for a while. Yeah. So the state actually appealed this decision, but the Wisconsin Supreme Court ended up upholding the circuit court's ruling. And they said that the primary purpose of Julie's statements to Officer Cosman were not to help police resolve an active emergency, but to investigate or aid in prosecution in the event of her death. So therefore, under the Confrontation Clause, Julie's statements were now inadmissible. Crazy. So in the end, the Supreme Court of Wisconsin remanded the case to the circuit court to determine whether or not Julie's statements were admissible under a different clause, a different doctrine oh called forfeiture by wrongdoing. So at that time, that doctrine stated that a defendant forfeits his constitutional right to confront a witness when the defendant caused that witness's unavailability. So the circuit court found that the state had shown through evidence that Mark did, in fact, cause Julie's unavailability. So therefore, confrontation clause be damned, Julie's statements now actually were admissible after all, which is like, I feel like I'm getting whiplash from all this like right? back, back and, and forth. forth. Yeah. So now the letter and statements that were made to Officer Cosman were allowed at the trial. And so this like reversal, this change, like really this ruling right here was an unprecedented move, I guess, to allow the statements in under like this different, it's kind of like they went in like a different way to get the letter and stuff in, which like I said before, I would not be the one to interpret what law means because right. it's wild to me that like that's even the thing that they can do. They just... Anything that was brought to me, I'd be like, sure, that's right. a good argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the story, you might remember a man named Charles from part one of the story, but if not, we'll jog your memory. Charles was a fellow stockbroker that Mark hung out with on a business trip in those weeks leading up to Julie's death. During that time, Mark had drank to excess that night, and basically he confessed his plan to poison Julie. Although he tried to make it seem like it was a casual conversation, which I don't even know how you would attempt to make that into a casual conversation, but he did. Well, Charles came forward while all of this back and forth was going on in the court system, and he told the prosecution about those things that Mark had said to him. Charles said he was scared of Mark, and that's why he was just now coming forward. In reality, Charles had been subpoenaed because another witness told investigators that Charles had mentioned this conversation with Mark. So after Charles gave his statement, Mark's bail was increased to $1.2 million due to flight risk, and he was taken back into custody. Behind bars, Mark made fast friends with another inmate named Aaron, and before too long, he was telling Aaron everything. Mark confessed to him about what he had done to Julie, probably not thinking his new buddy was going to rat him out, but that's exactly what happened. Aaron tells the police about Mark's jailhouse confession. And the thing about his 
conversation with Mark is he was able to give police details that only Mark would know regarding things that had never been shared publicly, so they knew that he was telling the truth. Aaron said that Mark told him he tried to poison Julie before he went away on a business trip in November. He said that when he returned home from that trip, Julie had been so sick that she had thrown up on the carpet and just put towels over it because she was too weak to clean it up. So Mark ended up hiring a professional carpet cleaner to come in and to clean it. Mark actually told Aaron that he was lucky that Julie didn't die that time because he didn't have a good story for his defense. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Mark told Aaron that after Julie got home from the doctor on December 1st, she took the Paxil she was prescribed along with Benadryl, which made her so loopy that she started jumping on the bed, but then she decided to just lie down. So that's when Mark gave her a glass of juice mixed with antifreeze to drink. Then he went online with Julie and looked up the side effects of Paxil to help calm her down. On the day before Julie's death, which was December 2nd, Julie was unable to keep any food down. And Mark said their doctors were really concerned and they wanted their dad to bring their mom to the doctor. Mark then explained how he went to Julie's doctor later that day and got her some sleeping pills. That was the Ambien we talked about in the last episode so that she would be able to go to sleep and feel at ease as she died. After he talked to the doctor about the Ambien, he then went and gave Julie more antifreeze with juice, and he gave her the Ambien in the evening so she would sleep. That night, Mark and the kids all laid in the bed with Julie, and Mark promised the boys he would take their mom to the hospital if she wasn't feeling better by the time he got home from work. Heartbreaking, just the picture of that and her Terrible. fighting for her life. And he's just saying, it's fine. And it's your dad. You trust your dad. Yeah. You're thinking like he knows he knows when it would be the right time to, you know, exactly. step in and take her to the hospital. So yeah, that's but the fact that the kids even knew like that she was that bad off. The fact that they had to see her in that condition is just yeah. Awful. It it really is. So the next morning, December 3rd, Mark said that Julie had made it through the night, but she wasn't able to get out of bed. He went to take the kids to school, and when he got back, Julie's breathing seemed to have improved. So Mark began to panic, thinking she was going to survive and he'd actually have to take her to the hospital. Mark then told Aaron the truth about what happened next. He said he rolled Julie onto her side and then sat on her while forcing her head into the pillow until she stopped breathing. Then... He left the house to go pick up his kids from school. When they got back to the house, he had the boys wait in the car while he went inside to check and see if Julie was really dead. She was, so he called 911. Aaron also mentioned that Mark brought up Charles and commented that he needed Charles to be kidnapped so he couldn't testify against him, which no wonder Charles was terrified of this man. Right. He's literally planning his kidnapping. Right. I mean, I, there's nothing he's not willing to try anyway, it seems like. Right. Like, what on earth? Another inmate named David that Mark talked to in prison also came forward and said that Mark had told him about needing to kidnap Charles as well. So David actually said that he kind of played along with this and suggested that his fiance, David's fiance, could actually kidnap Charles until the trial was over. And Mark actually seemed pretty serious about the whole thing. He called his mom, his own mom, many times and asked her to contact David's fiance. And he never would say what any of this was about. He said that he had to be really careful about what he said on the phone. But he did ask his mom to send money to David's fiance so that they could, you know, take care of something. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So Mark said, quote, we have to do whatever we possibly can to make sure we're on the winning side of this thing, end quote, which just makes me so, like, disgusted. Like, there's no winning side, you know, like, you're not on the winning no. side. Like, that's just terrible, a terrible thing to say. So Mark also asked his mom about doing paid talk show interviews and maybe getting what he th thought could be a million-dollar book deal. And he also talked about how everyone was going to just relax and have some fun together after the trial was over. When Mark's new wife, Kelly, found out that his mom was going to send money to David's fiance, she, of course, wanted to know what the deal was with that. And so she asked Mark what the money was for, but he just evaded the questions and wouldn't tell her anything. In another taped call with Kelly, Mark told her that he didn't really even care about the two boys he had with Julie, and he only cared about the son that he and Kelly had together. 
I never understand that. Like how how is that going to make that woman feel better? Exactly. Like, I'm just thinking like, okay, so then you could just stop caring about me and, and our son. my son. Right. Yeah. If you can just quit caring about your other kids, like I, I don't get what what he was trying to do there or what he no, thought. No, because that's not impressive. Like to a woman no. and a mother, like that would not impress me at all if he, you know, was like, I don't even like these other two kids. I'd be like, wait a minute. Right. Like, those are your babies. Like, what do you mean? Yeah. So yeah, doesn't that doesn't, sense. it really doesn't make any sense. Unfortunately for Mark, David and his fiance actually had no intention of helping him. Instead, David wrote a letter to his fiance and told her that they needed to go to the police. And so they did. And thankfully, Charles was not kidnapped and he was able to testify in Mark's trial. Opening statements began on January 7, 2008, which was over nine years after Julie was killed. At the time of his trial, Mark was 48 years old. Prosecutors said that Mark poisoned Julie with ethylene glycol and then smothered her, and that he had spent months conducting internet searches so he could commit a near-perfect crime and make Julie's death look like a suicide. They laid out multiple motives for Julie's murder, including Mark's affair and his planning of this whole new life with Kelly. And they also talked about how Mark lived in this constant state of bitterness about Julie's prior affair. And living like that actually caused him to engage in this campaign of emotional torture, as they called it, against Julie. Prosecutors also brought up how many people Julie had talked to about her fears that Mark was going to kill her one day and said that Julie didn't leave Mark because he threatened to make her seem like she was crazy so that she wouldn't get custody of the kids. Evidence was presented that showed that Julie was not suicidal and she was actually worried for her own safety and upset about the state of her marriage, neither of which would be a concern to somebody who was actually planning on taking their own life. Even though prosecutors did admit Julie's letter as evidence, they made sure they were able to corroborate nearly every single sentence of it with outside testimony. So, for example, for the part where Julie wrote, I don't know what it means, but if anything happens to me, he would be my first suspect. So to corroborate that, they had the neighbor Brian testify that Julie had told him on multiple occasions that she thought Mark was actually trying to poison her. And the teacher from the school also testified to the same thing. That was so smart on the prosecution's part to be able to go line by line yeah. to show it's not just the letter. It's also this is what we have to corroborate it. Right. So this part of the story is a little strange. On the first two days of trial, the state had Dr. Chamblis, that pathologist who performed the original autopsy, he actually testified. So on the first day he was on the stand, the doctor said he did not have enough information to determine a cause of death for Julie. However, when he got on the stand the second day, he said he had reviewed photos of Julie while she was still in bed, and he noticed that her nose and mouth were pressed to the side of the pillow. He said this was suspicious and showed signs that she had been smothered. He also said he could attribute smothering to previously unexplained throat bruising and petechia in the upper chest. Dr. Chamblis concluded that Julie's primary cause of death was asphyxia by smothering and the ethylene glycol could have contributed to her death. This testimony was a huge shock because the entire time the case had been pending, the prosecution's theory was that Julie had died from ethylene glycol poisoning, not that she had been smothered. The defense was super angry about this testimony, and they actually motioned for a mistrial, which was not granted. Later, another pathologist agreed with Dr. Chamblis's determination of smothering. And that also lines up with what Aaron had said, right? The confession that he had that Mark had given him in jail. So the defense told the jury that the facts would prove that Julie died by suicide and tried to frame Mark for murder because she knew about the affair that he was having. The defense claimed that Julie was depressed and disturbed and brought up that she'd been to a therapist at least three times for depression and that there was a history of depression in her family. They claimed that she lost a lot of weight due to her depression and that her, quote, despair and anger and her delusional thinking caused her to point her finger at Mark, end quote. Dr. Paul DeFazio testified about treating Julie for depression in 1990. Prosecutors pointed out that between Julie's appointments with Dr. Borman on September 21st and her visit on December 1st, Julie had only lost eight pounds, so it wasn't this massive amount of weight loss like Mark had been claiming. The defense claimed that Julie went to great lengths to frame Mark, including telling the neighbor and the teacher and Officer Cosman that she was in fear for her life. But when those people tried to help her, she refused their help. 
Mark's defense also said that it was actually Julie who made all those internet searches for poisoning, not him. Oh my gosh. He claimed that she was doing research in preparation for her suicide. But prosecutors actually countered this with significant evidence that Julie rarely even used the computers. But in contrast, Mark was really skilled at them, and he loved to surf the internet. It was also pointed out that Julie had never even sent a single email from that computer, and that was confirmed by the technician who looked through the computer after her death. And the searches that were made that they had found for these poison websites were made late at night or early in the morning, and those are times when Mark was always also at home. When Mark was away on business trips, they didn't find any searches or internet activity on the computer. The defense had their own toxicologist testify that Julie took antifreeze herself of her own free will in order to end her own life. Even though Mark already admitted that Julie was totally incoherent on the morning of December 3rd, this toxicologist testified that Julie could easily get up and walk around that morning. He also claimed that antifreeze has a terrible taste and would be impossible for Mark to hide it in drinks, even though there's a lot of reports that actually say the exact opposite. So... This is a little bit crazy bananas. At Mark's trial, they had a forensic pathologist named Dr. Mary Mainland testify about the ethylene glycol that was in Julie's system. So she actually did not conduct the original autopsy, but she did review the case, the toxicology findings, and medical records when she became the medical examiner in Kenosha County in 2005. So the prosecution actually had this doctor get on the stand and taste antifreeze herself. It was put in a styrofoam cup and then she dipped her fingers inside and just put it on her tongue and then she rinsed her mouth out with water and spit it out. And then she was asked how it tasted on the stand and she testified that it tasted sweet and then she smelled the antifreeze and said, quote, it's pleasant. It smells sweet like a tropical cocktail. So it's mind-blowing to me that they did that, like that they had her actually taste antifreeze. Yeah in court like that's just wild to me but i guess they were doing it to show like yeah you could easily hide this in juice because it tastes sweet and it doesn't have an odor really that makes it smell i feel like it does now though it does now yeah because i my husband's had it around for whatever reason and um for legitimate reasons and of course (laughs) i have smelled it and i'm like i don't think i could drink it now but maybe it was different back then Yeah. And I actually think that this case may have been one that actually helped change the law where it has to have like a nasty smell and taste to it because people had been poisoned. It was a, I hate to say great way, but it was a way that people were poisoning people and they wouldn't know because it was sweet and you could mix it with something else and you wouldn't notice. I remember watching this trial. I told you about this before, but I remember her being on the stand and that's like one thing that sticks out to me. Like trying it and being like, what is happening on court TV right now? Right. Like it was just wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Mark did not testify in his trial. Finally, on February 21st, after deliberating for around 32 hours in total, the jury found Mark guilty of first degree murder. Jurors later told the media that when it came time to deliberate, there was only five of them who wanted to convict, but over the next 32 hours, they calmly deliberated and in the end, They decided that the most important evidence they had was Julie's letter, the list of items that included syringes and booze, and the internet search for poisoning, specifically the one that happened while Julie was sick and bedridden, um, because, of course, the jurors didn't believe that she could have made that search if she was that incapacitated. So the jurors said that they did believe that Julie was depressed, but they pretty much said that they thought it was Mark's fault that she was depressed in the first place. And they did not believe that Julie died by suicide. They believed that Mark poisoned Julie. The one thing that they weren't totally sure about was the suffocation. So after the verdict was read, the prosecutor told the media he couldn't recall a more cold-blooded, calculated, and brutal offense. He said that Mark obsessed for months over killing Julie, and then after he succeeded, he worked hard to also try and murder the love her children had for her, which is so gut-wrenching to think. And then, you know, and not only that, but like, I believe that he didn't like his kids because why would you do that to them? You know what I'm saying? Like how he told Kelly, like, I don't even care about these kids. I'm like, well, I totally believe you that you don't because any of this, like, how could you do that to them? You know, it's... it. Just terrible. He's taken everything Everything, from them. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark's sentencing was scheduled for the following week. 
The mandatory sentence was life in prison, but the judge could decide on one of three different options. He could either give him life with parole after 20 years, or he could give him life in prison with parole eligibility after 20 years, or he could give him life in prison without the possibility of parole at all. And we're going to get right back into what the judge decided after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we were discussing uh, Mark's trial, what occurred during it, and we've now reached the sentencing portion. Mark was sentenced on February 27th. His parents, sister, and Kelly were all in the courtroom, but none of them spoke. Julie's brothers gave victim impact statements in which they said that Mark hid behind a mask of fatherhood after Julie died and then, quote, spit on her grave, end quote, by claiming that she took her own life. Her brother Paul also stated that Mark had convinced Julie's sons that she had left them stranded. Because of how long it took for the case to go to trial, the kids were actually 18 and 12 when Mark was found guilty of their mom's murder. The boys actually wrote a letter to the judge asking that Mark be let out of prison as early as the law allowed. The boys had never made a statement up until this point, but the letter read in part, quote, Throughout this case, we have remained silent, and the true character of our father has remained obscured. We write this to give voice to the type of man he is, end quote. They said Mark was innocent, he was supportive, and he was loyal. They referred to Julie as their birth mother, stating, quote, We were, all of us, devastated at her loss, and the memory of Mark crying while holding his sons on his lap is one of my most vivid, end quote. Both boys actually signed this letter, but keep in mind, one of them is only 12 at this time, so it was probably written by the older one and possibly another adult. Prosecutors said that they understood why the kids felt their dad was innocent, but they encouraged them to look at the evidence in the case. At the end of it all, the judge sentenced Mark to life in prison without parole and said, quote, if I were to impose anything less than the maximum, I'd feel I had cheated other people. Because your crime is so enormous, so monstrous, so unspeakably cruel that it overcomes all other considerations, end quote. In April, Kelly became the legal guardian for both of Julie and Mark's sons. A month later, Kelly filed for divorce from Mark. But that's not where the story ends. Mark appealed his conviction on the grounds that Julie's letter never should have been admissible in his trial. Mark and his defense team constantly acted like the letter was the only evidence the state had against Mark and that he was convicted based on that piece of evidence alone. Of course, that's not true at all. They had countless other evidence besides the letter, but that's what they were pushing. So while the appeal was pending, the U.S. Supreme Court actually decided another case that happened to be directly affecting Mark. Like I said before, like it's wild to think about having to keep all these things straight, you know, these different clauses and different things that could be affecting this case and then having to like you know change your course based on like different supreme court decisions and things like that so the supreme court decided another case and that was the case of giles versus california and with that case the court refined the forfeiture by wrongdoing doctrine that we mentioned before and they decided that it only applies when the defendant caused the witness's unavailability with the specific intent of preventing the witness from testifying. So the Court of Appeals um, applied that ruling to Mark's appeal. They said that they assumed Mark hadn't killed Julie specifically to keep her from testifying at trial. Therefore, under the latest Supreme Court ruling, Mark actually had not forfeited his confrontation clause rights, and they ruled that the circuit court made an error when they allowed Julie's statements in as evidence, which is like we're back to this again. Like we're back to do they, you know, yeah, do they let them in? they not let them in. So, however, the Court of Appeals also found that this error was harmless considering the volume of other evidence that did support the guilty verdict. The Court of Appeals said, quote, this case was not a classic whodunit. They said, besides the letter, there was other gripping evidence against Mark. And they even said that without the letter, a rational jury would have taken all the gripping evidence and concluded beyond a reasonable doubt that Mark, quote, cruelly planned and plotted and in fact carried out the murder of his wife, Julie. The conclusion that this was just a harmless error ended up being the basis for Mark's uh, federal habeas corpus later. So in federal court, Mark really saw a win. They agreed that it was not just a harmless error to admit Julie's testimonial statements because, of course, it was in violation of the confrontation clause. So in December of 2013, the federal court vacated Mark's conviction and ordered his release from custody. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
The prosecution immediately appealed the case, but the decision was upheld, so they decided that they would just initiate the proceedings for a retrial. But then, in 2017, a circuit court judge reinstated Mark's conviction, and in 2020, the Wisconsin Court of Appeals reversed the circuit court judge's reinstatement oh of that convi- of the original conviction, and that meant that his conviction was now vacated again. So the case was then remanded to the circuit court for even further proceedings. This is this is like a classic example of a case that I feel like is just a massive expense for like the whole system. You know, it just keeps yeah. getting bounced back and forth from different different court systems. So the state then announced their intent to actually retry the case. And after further litigation, it was ruled once and for all that Julie's letter and the voicemail she left for Officer Cosman were not allowed to be submitted as evidence in the second trial. Absolutely wild. So finally, Mark's retrial began on January 11th, 2023, so that was just a couple months ago, and Mark is now 63 years old. This trial was really almost identical to the first one, except they left out the letter and they left out the voicemails. The same prosecutor from the first trial was back again for the retrial, and he argued that Mark poisoned and possibly suffocated Julie. The defense said Mark was framed and that Julie died by suicide. Many of the same witnesses testified again, although some of them had died or were unable to testify again, so videos of their testimony from the first trial were played for the jury. Honestly, I'm surprised the defense didn't fight that and Me say, too. we don't know if they would say that again right. or whatever. There was, however, one new person that testified, and that was Mark and Julie's oldest son. He said he saw Mark sobbing after Julie died and that it was the first time he'd ever seen his dad cry. Once again, in this trial, Mark chose not to testify. After three weeks of testimony and six hours of deliberating, the jury came to their verdict on February 1st, 2023. Mark was found guilty of first-degree murder again, and none of the jurors spoke to the media following the trial. Mark said he plans to appeal this conviction, but legal experts have weighed in and said it's unlikely that Mark will get his conviction overturned now that Julie's statements weren't even included. One law professor pointed out that since other courts had already decided so many issues in this case, the defense had very little in which to even raise an appeal on. After the verdict, the prosecutor read Julie's letter to the media and said he believes the Wisconsin Supreme Court got the issue of Julie's letter wrong. He said, quote, I think victims have a right to be heard in court, end quote. That gave me chills. The prosecutor said that he went to the Jensen house the day Julie was found dead and he saw her lying dead in her bed. He told the media, quote, I didn't know at the time it was going to take a third of my life to put Mark Jensen away, but it was worth it, and I would do it again if the opportunity or necessity arose, end quote. As of this research, Mark is still awaiting sentencing. His hearing is actually scheduled for April 14th. He will get one of three sentences, life in prison with parole after 20 years, life in prison with parole eligibility after 20 years, or life in prison without parole. Following the guilty verdict in Mark's retrial, Julie's brother Larry spoke to Fox 6 Now. He said Julie loved her sons more than anything, and she never would have left them. He said the family was very hurt after Mark tried to say Julie was irrational and suicidal. He said that going to the trials was very uncomfortable, but they did it because they had to, quote, follow through on Julie's words, desperate words that she wrote on November 21st, 1998. If anything happens to me, he would be my first suspect, end quote. They said they needed to be there to make sure that Mark stayed behind bars. Larry also brought up Women and Children's Horizons, which is a shelter in Kenosha that advocates for victims of domestic abuse. He said he hopes Julie's story encourages people who find themselves in a similar situation to ask for help. And we also wanted to share a little more information. If you or someone you know needs help, you can call the Nationwide Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. So that's 1-800-799-7233. You can also chat at thehotline.org or you can text the word START to 88788. All three of these are 24-7, they're free, and they're confidential. There are many other resources on the Domestic Violence Hotline website. Andy, how do you even sum up a story like this? It's it's you don't gone over sum it up. That's why we had to do it in two episodes. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. I mean, you you yeah, it's amazing that it went for so long. The things that were 
I don't know. It's just wild to me that Julie's letter could ever be thrown out. It just seems yeah. so important. And like, how many people have that? How many people basically give you give it to you on a golden platter? Like, here's who my murderer is. Basically, I mean, right. she, and like, she honestly, gave it to what them. a slap in the face to like the victim who wrote it. Like, yeah, like okay, like I didn't write this for nothing. You know, like there was right. obviously a reason why I wanted this to be written down, like where somebody would have these answers to questions they might have. Like if something happens, it's wild to think that there would be any, any way of getting that like out of his trial. But yeah, it ended up being like that big of a deal in this case. And it delayed getting like an actual conviction for him like to stick for years. Like he's old now. Like he literally was basically out pretty much his entire life. So that's, that's a little upsetting to think about, but for sure. And I feel for their sons. Um, and what the prosecution said, I think, makes a lot of sense that he could basically understand why they would want to support their dad. It would be almost impossible to feel like your dad is the one that killed right. your mom. Like, that's such You've a You've already lost grasp. your mom. Right. Yeah. And so I understand. And I liked what he said about just looking over the evidence. So, yeah. 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 Hope they're doing well. <laughs> Me too. All right, Melissa, are you ready to move on to last thing before we go for the week? I am, Mandy. Are you ready to mix it up and do something we've done before because we (laughs) could not do the thing we originally planned to do? Yes, I am. We are going to do everyone's favorite game. Actually, I don't think that's... I don't know if it's everyone's, but there are some people who really like it, so... I know. I think it's because we did the thing where we said we were going to take it away and never play it again. And they're like, yeah, they're they're like, no, we love it. Yeah. (laughs) So So, this is what you get. (laughs) This is what you get. So we are going to play the... We don't know what it's called. Word game, maybe. <laughs> We're going to play this where one of us thinks of a word. Wait, how do you play it? One of us thinks of a word. Mandy? Hold on. No, you're both, both trying say to a word get at the same to time. the same. We both say a word at the same time. No. Yes. No. Oh, wait. Hold on. I think we both say it at the same time. We're trying to get to the same Don't we have to, to pick a category word. or no? We just say random words? You can pick words. a category. Pick a category. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pick a category. Traveling. Okay. Ooh, that's way too vague. That's, that's that's way too vague. We'll never get there. How about <laughs> things you find inside your home? Okay. I, think, I feel like we did this before. I mean, it could still be anything, but yes. How have we? How do we get by? How have we done this before? Many I times. I don't know. And we seem like I know. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, let's do this, Melissa. Okay. So, okay, we'll just say things inside the house. Okay. Ready? Things okay. inside. A normal person's house, not a hoarder's house. It's normal things you would find. Okay. You're not not like dead cats in a hoarder's freezer. Okay, ready? Oh, wait. So, but wait, wait. What are we trying to do? Say the same thing. Say the same word. We're trying to get to the same word. So we both say something, kind of figure out what it has in common, try and get closer and closer until we both say the same thing. All right. Got it. Are we ready? Right. Ready? One, two, three. Mirror. Refrigerator. Okay. Refrigerator and mirror. One, two, three, sink. Whoa! <laughs> Honestly, that was amazing. I don't know how we did that. That's either. crazy. The lead up was worse than the ending of it. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, I don't want to risk it and do another one. Do you? I no. No, like that was too good. Um, we'll have a new idea next week. Sorry, this week didn't work out, but we've got we've got another one planned. The art thing I think we'll do next week, right? We do. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually just been a really crazy week. We got both of the parts of this uh, two-part episode done this week. So that's not an excuse. It's just a fact I'm sharing. <laughs> it, it sounds it, like well, I'm making like, an excuse, like we can't no. handle the pressure. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, it is a reason why we're a, reason. a little flustered and yes. <laughs> everything's got to be done by tonight. So yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot in our little world. And then rain and just holidays. and Especially when you weren't expecting rain, you're just like, what's going on? I didn't know it was going to rain all week. Apparently, it's going to rain all week. I'm Maybe just finding this out for back, the first time. We're doing the weather report at the end of the show. We're back to the summer and the rain and just yes, constant. This is going are. to be our new thing. And I'm so This is mad. April showers, right? April showers. Yeah. Screw May flowers because it's actually going to rain in May, July, all the months. <laughs> From now until November. I die. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is November apparently. Okay, Mandy. Well, that was great. Let's do it again in a week. All right, we sure will. We'll be back next week, same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye.